afternoon, everybody. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Pernilla Wittung Stofschut. Uh, she's uh, at Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, it's really a pleasure because I've met Pernilla since several years. We're good friends. We've done a lot of collaborative work together and followed our common interests. But Pernilla, she's, uh, she did her, her PhD in uh, physical chemistry in 1996 at Chalmers. And then she moved for a postdoc at Caltech where she worked uh, with Harry Gray. She was there for a couple of years. And in 1999, she became an independent researcher, an assistant researcher, assistant professor at the, the chemistry department at Tulane University uh, in New Orleans, uh, where she uh, did a, an outstanding career. She got tenured there at, in 2002 and then became associate professor. And then um, there was a back to the origins, I would say, in 2008, she returned to Sweden, to, to Humia, a uh, university in the north of Sweden. Um, and she was there until 2015, where she moved to Chalmers to set up, I think, this new biology and biological engineering department, which she had it uh, for some time. And of course, Pernilla, uh, she's a very active researcher and academic uh, in, in worldwide and, and also in Sweden. She became member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in, in 2016. And since 2020, she has been a member of the Chemistry Nobel Prize Committee. And apart from this uh, uh, outstanding academic and scientific work, uh, Pernilla, she's also committed to a very important topic, which has to do with diversity and gender equality in academia in general and in uh, Chalmers in particular. So she has been leading this uh, initiative called Jenny, Gender Initiative for Excellence, which is a 10 year uh, program that Pernilla is heading since its start in 2009. And we wish you all the best for that. In, in terms of research, as you will see, Pernilla, she's an expert on protein biophysics and folding. She has a focus on uh, mechanisms of uh, copper transport proteins, amyloid formation, cross-reactivity mechanisms. Pernilla has published over 250 papers. And today she will tell us about cross-reactivity of Parkinson's disease protein alpha synuclein. Thank you very much, Pernilla. Thank you very, very much for that introduction, Claudio, and nice to meet everybody this way, and thank you for having me giving a talk. So I will tell you about the work that we have been doing on alpha-synuclein, the protein involved in Parkinson's disease. And as Claudia said, I'm at Chalmers University in Gothenburg, Sweden. Okay, let's see. Okay. And I need to be able to click like that. So I wanted to, to begin when I started my own independent research group. As Claudio said, I started to work on protein folding, biophysical studies of protein folding, how, what are the folding mechanisms? And we tried to figure out uh, how different types of proteins work, metalloproteins, oligomeric proteins, and, and so on. And that has, over the years, led to a current focus or a gradual shift to more understanding function and dysfunction of proteins and interactions with other species. So today we have kind of two directions in the lab, and one is about metal transport, by metal transport proteins. And here we focus on copper transport proteins. And that has led us into cancer studies as well, because some of these copper transport proteins seem to play a key role. And then the other part of the lab is that we have gone from folding to misfolding, and we start to look at amyloid formation. And this is what I will tell you about today. So I will, will be, begin by introducing the, the target, alpha-synuclein. Many of you know a lot about this protein, but I thought I would give you the brief overview so we all are on the same page. This is 140 residue intrinsically unstructured protein. It's involved in neurotransmission, synaptic vesicle transport. It's not really clear what it does. Is found in the brain, but also elsewhere in the body. It has a membrane binding part, and the N terminus is, is positively charged, and the C terminus is negatively charged. And in the middle, you have the amyloid core. So when this protein interacts with vesicles, membrane vesicles, it adopts an helical structure in the N terminus. 
Octosinuclein can assemble into amyloid fibers that are similar to those found in other neurodegenerative disorders. And we today know that amyloids can take somewhat different shapes or the different polymorphs and strains that have slight differences in the core. And many compounds can affect alpha-synuclein amyloid formation. Both synthetic and natural uh, molecules can tune the reaction in, in both faster or slower. And this protein is then the key in Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease is a global burden, like Alzheimer's. Many people have Parkinson's disease in the world, and the number is growing. And this is because the, uh, the largest risk, greatest risk factor is age, and the population is getting older and older. So we'll get more and more of these diseases. And we have no cure today. And the hallmark of Parkinson's disease is something called Lewy bodies. They are found in dopamine neurons in the brain of patients. And when these neurons then die, dopamine release is reduced, and that leads to the typical motor complications of these patients. And these Lewy bodies contain alpha-synuclein amyloid fibers, and that's how the protein was linked to the disease. But it's not yet clear what species along the progression towards amyloid fibers is toxic. It's thought that maybe smaller assemblies, oligomeres, may be most dangerous. There are also ideas now that Parkinson's disease starts in the periphery, perhaps in the gut, and then is somehow transmitted to the brain. So we take a mostly biophysical approach here to learn more about the system. We want to understand how do amyloid fibers form? How can we tune that? And coming from the protein folding field, where reactions are two-state and reversible, and you can quantify uh, a lot of parameters, amyloid formation is really complicated. You go from nanometer monomers to micrometer amyloid fibers. There are many processes involved. Monomers can assemble to oligomers, nucleation. You have further assembly to amyloids, elongation, and you can have secondary processes. And all of this might be very heterogeneous as well. And you can have off-pathway aggregates and oligomers. So we want to try to figure out mechanisms and how to control and stop these reactions. And here it's important to consider interactions with other molecules because the cells are full of various biomolecules. So there's ample opportunity to interact with other species in a cell. So we started out looking at alpha-synuclein amyloid formation using biophysics. We began looking at small molecules, two pyridone type of molecules that we could use as tools to tune these reactions. We found one molecule that would speed up aggregation and using that, we could study intermediate species. And we also could feed it to animals to see early signs of Parkinson's. We looked at bacterial proteins that might be present in the gut. And we found that they can both accelerate or slow down amyloid formation. And they also, in collaboration, we have studied germ-free mice with uh, bacteria added in to see how different bacteria can link to Parkinson's disease development. We also looked at the link to, between type 2 diabetes and Parkinson's, because it's known from patients that type 2 diabetes patients are prone to get Parkinson's, but it's not clear what the molecular link is. And then we found that this protein insulin degrading enzyme, which is many times gone in type 2 diabetes, can interact with alpha-synuclein oligomers and block them from further aggregation. So if you remove that IgE protein, perhaps the nucleus can go on and aggregate. We also found that the amyloidogenic protein in type 2 diabetes, IIPP, can accelerate synuclein amyloid formation. And I should say that that synuclein is also expressed in the pancreas where, where uh, type 2 diabetes um, takes place. And also IIPP is found in the brain. So for sure, these proteins can meet. We also looked at interactions with membranes. I said uh, synuclein can bind to lipid vesicles. And we tried to look at the role of the chemistry of the head group of the lipids. And we also looked at deformation of vesicles induced by synuclein using single vesicle techniques. Most of the time we don't think about it, but uh, synuclein is also found in the nucleus. And we can see that. And so therefore we looked at interactions with DNA and we could see that uh, using nanochannel experiments with single DNA uh, friend, or, or pieces, we could see that synuclein would stretch the DNA. But when we truncated the C-terminus of synuclein, instead we compacted the DNA. So maybe this can play a role in some kind of 
gene regulation dysfunction. And what I will talk about now, the rest of the time, is on our recent work on three other putative amyloid effectors. I'll talk about the copper chaperone, ATOT. I'll talk about an amylodogenic fish protein. And I'll end with steric effects due to the crowded cell environment. So first, can a copper chaperone play a role in alpha synuclein aggregation? Well, perhaps synuclein binds copper in vivo. And this is work by a, a, a researcher of mine, Istvan Horvat. And there's some NMR I'll show you that we did in collaboration with Bjorn Burman. So we know that, that metal homeostasis, copper homeostasis specifically, is disturbed in Parkinson's disease. We have less copper in neuronal cells when you have Parkinson's. And we know from in vitro work that both copper 2 plus and copper 1 plus, copper is redox active, both forms of copper can bind to alpha synuclein in vitro. And we have characterized binding sites and affinities for these different uh, metal ions. And also copper 2 plus can speed up aggregation of alpha synuclein in a test tube. But we don't really know the effect of copper 1 plus on synuclein aggregation because it's very hard to do those experiments with reducing conditions and keeping copper one in solution. So we don't know. However, in a cell, in vivo, synuclein is mostly acetylated in the N-terminus, which means that we block the high affinity copper, copper two binding site. Um, and also we see, or see if we add acetylated alpha synuclein and mix it with copper two plus, we don't have an effect on the aggregation kinetics. However, First, in a cell, there's no free copper. So maybe we're doing the wrong experiments here. And also all the copper in a cell is transported as copper one. So we would think that in, and in copper transport in a cell, we have this copper chaperone eight box that moves around the copper in the cytoplasm, delivering it to ATP acids in the Golgi that then deliver the copper to copper dependent enzymes. So we thought that if there would be and biological relevance and synuclein would bind copper in vivo, maybe ATOX plays a role as a delivery of copper. So we wanted to test if ATOX can interact with alpha synuclein. And this is ATOX, it's a small protein with a CXXC motif that can bind to copper one plus. So when we add in this protein in synuclein aggregation reactions, we see that ATOX can block aggregation. And this is a copper dependent reaction. If we take the APO protein, nothing happens. But it does not depend on, on acetylation. We also could truncate the synuclein in the C terminus, and we got the same effect of inhibition, meaning that, that somehow whatever goes on happens in the end term. So to test if we have actually copper transfer or we have an interaction between the two proteins, we turn to biocore experiments or surface plasma resonance. So we put ATOX um, on the chip, and then we were flowing synuclein on top of that. And we could see that copper-loaded ATOX would interact with synuclein, acetylated or not, truncated or not, with roughly the same micromolar affinity. So it seems like ATOX binds to the N-terminus of synuclein. And this makes sense because the copper-1 binding site in synuclein involves two methionines in the N-terminus. So perhaps we form a ternary complex uh, where the metal is bridged between the two proteins. This is the typical type of intermediates that you have in regular copper transports between proteins along this secretory pathway chain. So to look into this, we turn to NMR. So we label both proteins individually, one at a time. So first I'll show you when we label the nucleus and we add on ATOX to see what happens. So here we can see that the intensity changes uh, when we add copper-loaded ATOX in the N-terminus of synuclein, but also at some other place. If I add APO ATOX, nothing happens. Then we label ATOX to turn the experiment around, and we add synuclein. And then we can see that we have chemical shift changes around the copper binding site in ATOX, maybe some other places as well. And we also see increased dynamics around the copper binding site in ATOX which makes sense if you interact with the floppy unstructured proteins, nucleus, and you are a folded protein yourself. Again, no effect on APO ATOX. So if I map all these interaction sites on the two proteins, as I've done here, 
we can see that we have interactions going on near the two cysteines and the copper binding site in Ajox and in the N-terminus in synuclein coming to the methionines. So it seems like we have a copper dependent complex where the metal is bridged between the two proteins. It involves additional interactions but they are not, not sufficient on their own to form a complex in the absence of copper. So is there any biological relevance to this type of complex? Well, we tried to look for that. So here we did proximity ligation assay experiments in cells. And with this method, you can look at proximity. It's not interactions. It's proximity within 40 nanometers of each other. You can look for two proteins being near each other using antibodies and DNA rolling circle amplification. So we tested hex cells and sushi neuronal cells, and we found that we had a copper dependent proximity. We got more uh, of these two proteins close to each other when we added more copper um, in both cell types. So what we think might be going on, speculation, is that under normal conditions, you would have some of this complex uh, bridged by copper, Therefore, you have less free synuclein that can go on and form amyloids. If you have uh, low copper conditions, such as in Parkinson's, you would not have this complex. You would have more free alpha synuclein, and therefore, you have more protein that can go on and form amyloids. Of course, there's much more to do here. And what we want to do now, and is trying to set up, is a yeast cell model where we can also look at aggregation in the cell of synuclein. And here we can play with copper, we can play with the human copper proteins, overexpressing them, mutating them, and look at different synuclein variants. The next topic is about the fish protein. That might be, you know, if you think really positive, a way to curb Parkinson's disease in the future. And this is work by a graduate student of mine, Tony Banner, that graduated last year. So we know that fish is good for the brain, right? But what is the good part in fish? We talk about fatty acids, but there's also a lot of protein in fish. There's one protein called pervalbumin that's very abundant in fish. It's an allergen. So if you're allergic to fish, this is the protein you create antibodies to. This is a calcium binding protein. Looks like a calmodulin-like protein. But because it's an allergen, we know it can pass through the gut because it must be found intact in the blood. So we make antibodies. So this protein, if you remove the calcium with EDTA, for example, it readily forms amyloids. But in presence of calcium, there's no amyloid formation. It just stays monomer. So the idea is that the low pH in the gut will trigger calcium release, and therefore the protein forms amyloids. The amyloids are very stable and survive the gut and can come escape out into the blood. And therefore it can also then trigger an, uh, an allergic response. So we were thinking that maybe paravalbumin and synuclein can meet somewhere in the body, in the blood, in the brain, the enteric nerve. We have these enteroendocrine cells that connect the gut to the enteric nerve. And we know that synuclein is expressed there. And some of our experiments have shown that, we, that paravalbumin can probably enter those types of cells. So we decided to test for cross-reactivity. What we found when we mix the two proteins and both of them can aggregate, is that it seems like synuclein aggregation is blocked by the presence of apoparvalbumin. If I look at the curve for the mixture, it looks exactly the same as the kinetics for apoparvalbumin alone. But you don't see the, the synuclein aggregation um, pattern. So there's no effect on the parvalbumin aggregation kinetic itself, but it seems like you block synuclein aggregation. Calcium parvalbumin, on the other hand, the monomer, does not affect synuclein at formation. So when we look by AFM, how these fibers look like, the nuclear fibers are a bit thicker than parvalbumin fibers, so we can distinguish them. When I have the mixture, we only see parvalbumin fibers. So this again confirms that we somehow block synuclein aggregation. But because we have no effect on the kinetics, it seems like we first form parvalbumin amyloids, and then somehow they block synuclein aggregation. So if that's true, we should could we can preform parvalbumin amyloids and then add synuclein and nothing should happen. And indeed, if we add preformed parvalbumin amyloids, we also inhib inhibit synuclein amyloid formation. So maybe synuclein binds to parvalbumin amyloid uh, surfaces. So to test that, we turn to EM and gold nanoparticles. 
So we did the mixture, we had synuclein antibodies coupled to nanoparticles, so we could see them. And what we found is that in principle, you see that synuclein is scattered along the pravalbumin amyloid fibers. So it looks some kind of like a kinetic sequestering process. We can add in calcium, and then that will release the nucleon, and the nucleon starts to aggregate. And that makes sense because the calcium sites in parvalbumin are not thought to be in the amyloid core. So maybe they protrude from the amyloid, and the nucleon and calcium might compete for the same binding sites on the parvalbumin amyloid. So of course, as I mentioned before, synuclein is acetylated in the N-terminus in vivo. So we also tested this form of synuclein. And here again, you have the same inhibitory uh, reaction when you add parvalbumin fibers. So acetylation doesn't matter. So then we try to look for a salt defect to try to figure out what interactions are involved. But there was really no salt effect at all. So the interaction is not dominated by electrostatics. So we're thinking that maybe there's some specificity hydrophobic interactions involved. But taken together, we see this as a new mechanism of inhibition. So nuclear monomers can be scavenged by parvalbumin amyloids. You bind them, and then you can, for example, add calcium and you can release the protein again as the nuclein can go on and aggregate. It's kind of like a colloidal inhibition mechanism. But here we have a preformed amyloid that inhibits another amyloidogenic protein. So the key question now, which I asked, and maybe you also asked now, is does this work on other amyloidogenic proteins? So we immediately thought about testing this on amyloid beta aggregation, the key protein in, in Alzheimer's disease. And we tried. And the answer is not yes and no. It's maybe in part. We see an effect. We slow down A beta amyloid formation by the presence of pravalbumin amyloids. If, if you analyze these kinetic curves, it looks like we block secondary nucleation. So maybe pravalbumin amyloids actually bind amyloid beta amyloids and block them from further, from nucleating uh, more amyloids. We have more work to do here. But the idea is can, can we somehow use pravalbumin amyloids by eating fish or somehow supplementing it? to curb Parkinson's disease. Can we make that work somehow? Of course, there's a lot of things we want to do here. We want to now feed these amyloids to some animal models to see how it works in a, in a living system. And I want to test the generality of this inhibitory effect more on other human amyloid proteins and also go in and do more on amyloid beta. As a parenthesis here, I want to say that this protein pervalbumin actually displayed a unique amyloid formation mechanism itself that was interesting to characterize. So when we looked at the amyloid formation early on, we realized there was no secondary processes. We can use amylofit and we can use other ways to look at that, but we only had nucleation and elongation. But we detected many, many times there were some dimers present in the final amyloids. So we started to look into that. So then we tested oxidizing and reducing conditions. So we could see that oxidizing conditions would speed up amyloid formation, whereas reducing conditions would slow down amyloid formation. And that related to how much monomers and dimers we had in the final amyloids as well. This protein has one cysteine, and that can form a disulfide to another cysteine in, an, in another monomer, and you form a dimer. And it turns out that this cysteine is not so exposed in the calcium-bound form. And there we never see any dimers, but in the APO form, it's more exposed. So that makes sense that actually when you have the APO protein that could am form amyloids, it can, you can also form a dimer. So then we can make, even make preformed folded dimers. They were also all still folded and they accelerate the reaction. So they will speed up the reaction. So we can use them as a seed in a way, and we get the same type of fibers in terms of the morphology. So by doing a bunch of experiments, we could then show that this preformed or this folded dimer is an early species on, on the pathway to the amyloids. And this is interesting because not much is known about interprotein disulfides in amyloid formation, but it might be clinically relevant because oxidative stress is often a hallmark of, am of amyloid diseases. So perhaps there could be other proteins out there that 
during oxidative stress can form a disulfide and maybe that can trigger something. Finally, I want to talk about macromolecular crowding, how that can modulate, modulate amyloid formation because the cells are full of stuff. So you will definitely bump into other things. And this is again, Istvan that has done this work. So the cell is a scary jungle of big stuff, you can say. Proteins fold and function in, cell, in a cell environment that's clouded with other macromolecules. There can be up to 300 mg per mil of biomolecules in a cell. That's highly crowded. This truly, the, the cell is not the test tube condition that we like to use to make our, our experiments. So this means that volume is excluded and that's a steric effect, but you can also have non-specific and palpic interactions. The viscosity gets higher and also heterogeneous. And this excluded volume effect favors compact structures. So it will stabilize folded or assembled species, the ones that take up the least amount of space. And over the years, we have studied uh, crowding effects or excluded volume effects on many small monomeric proteins. So we looked at energetics, kinetics, structural effects due to crowding. And we want to now try to use what our experience of how to do these experiments to look at amyloid formation. So how does crowding affect amyloid formation? This will depend on intermediate conformations and rate limiting steps. So it's going to be more complex. And we mimic the cell with a crowding agent called FICO7. There could be other crowding agents too, but this one is really useful. <clears throat> it's very soluble, it's a polysaccharide. So we can, and we can go up to 300 mg per mil without problems. It's supposed to not interact with proteins and many studies support that, uh, which is good, which means it will give steric effects only. And there's no absorption about 200 nanometer, which is really helpful for the experiment. So when we started to add crowding to synuclein amyloid formation reactions, we learned immediately that this shaking bead condition that we typically use, so normally when we aggregate synuclein, we have shaking conditions in the plate reader and we add one glass bead in order to get the reaction to go within say 20 hours. Here, when we add crowding, we affect the viscosity. So we affect the movement of the bead, which means that we will have multiple effects going on in those reactions. So instead, we turn to quiescent conditions where we have no shaking. We just wait. And for synuclein alone in buffer, it would take a week or so before it starts to aggregate. But we found that when we add crowding agents, you speed up the reaction. And we could detect it. So we see that the reaction is maybe at least tenfold accelerated by add additional crowding agents. But this is the overall reaction. This could be any one of the steps on the, on the pathway. So we thought we would look into, do we affect nucleation, the early phase of, of this reaction? So we looked after four hours of reaction using AFM to see what we have in the sample. And if I look in buffer, after four hours, nothing has happened. It's totally dry. But in, with the presence of FICO, we see all these oligomers, small oligomers. And I should say that these dots are not FICO, FICO looks different with AFM. The primary nucleation is accelerated. What about elongation? So we can look at elongation more specifically by using seeded reactions. We add sonicated fibers, preformed amyloids that we sonicate, get many ends. In this way, we bypass nucleation, the slow step. So we have no lag phase, as you can see in my graph here. So when I look at uh, fiber elongation or in the presence of crowding at three different here percentages of seeds added, you see that by addition of FICO, the reaction goes faster. I can also plot the data at the three different conditions, buffer and two concentrations of FICO as a function of a percent of seeds. And then we see that the more seeds that we add, the faster it goes. From this type of data, I can plot the initial rates versus the seed percentage which I show here, and this, these plots are linear. And that supports through equations that we are looking at elongation in those early time scales, the initial rate uh, analysis. And we can see that the crowded condition is about twofold faster than in buffer. 
So elongation is accelerated. What about secondary pathway? Well, typically at pH seven, like we have here, the nucleon forms amyloids without much secondary pathways going on. And you can see that from the buffer condition here to the left where I write hyperbolic, the curves are hyperbolic. It doesn't seem like it's more than elongation going on. But if we look at the crowded conditions, the data looks biphasic at the low seed concentration. So maybe this is actually secondary nucleation coming in. So to look at secondary nucleation more um, specifically, we can turn to non-sonicated seeds. Now we have longer fibers. We have less ends and more surface. And then secondary nucleation will be enhanced. And we can see here on the data, this is now uh, reactions in buffer and the two different phycal conditions. And even in buffer at the lowest seed percentage, the curves look a little bit, the curve look a little bit biphasic, you know, if you, if you really look at it. But if you look at the FICO data, clearly you have biphasic data. So I can now plot the midpoint of those reactions versus the log of the seed concentration. Equations that people ha have uh, derived say that if this plot is linear, you have only two phases. You have elongation and, and secondary nucleation. And we have linear, a linear dependence, which supports that we have secondary nucleation. And I should also say that within this time scale that I look at here, there's no primary nucleation going on. We know that takes much longer. And we also don't have any secondary fragmentation, probably, because we don't shake the sample. And that's how we get fragmentation normally. So if I look at this, I mean, and if I believe I have a point in buffer that has some biphasic behavior, I can you know, estimate that you know, there's several fold faster secondary nucleation in the crowded condition. But clearly we have just more of it. I can also plot the data for the three different uh, seed percentages as a function you know, for buffer and the two crowded conditions. And here we seem to see that we reach some kind of saturation. The two crowded conditions look very similar. But it could also be that the higher viscosity, the more crowding we add, start to hamper the reaction. So you cancel out the effect. But nonetheless, secondary nucleation is clearly promoted under these conditions. So if I put it all together, it's not really a change in mechanism, but you accelerate individual steps. Maybe not so much, two, three, four, five fold, but still in biology, Two, threefold differences might be really important because all reactions are so tuned to the optimal behavior. And we also have promotion of secondary nucleation as physiological, physiological condition. More monomers go through that pathway, which means that in a cell, a smaller number of fiber Cs will have a larger catalyzing effect than that we see in a test tube. Is this a general crowding effect? on amyloid formation? I think it is for disordered proteins because then uh, the assembled state the amyloids are smaller and more folded. So therefore you would push amyloid formation uh, of disordered proteins. But what about the folded amyloidogenic protein? Folded proteins are often stabilized by crowding and that would reduce amyloid formation. And folded amyloidogenic proteins, and we know many of those, they are often oligomers. And they need to dissociate to partly fold in monomers and then amyloid formation is triggered. So then crowding will stabilize this folded oligomer and therefore you would have less amyloid formation. But what about the folded monomer that actually has a folded dimer on the amyloid formation pathway? So we tested this on our pervalvimine system. And what we found is that in contrast to other folded amyloidogenic proteins, Provalbumin amyloid formation is accelerated by cycle additions. And we could see from this curve that we seem to accelerate both nucleation and elongation, but we could also look specifically on elongation using seeding reactions, and that's also faster. So we speed up all the different steps here again. So nucleation, this kind of suggests, that, uh, su suggests support that nucleation does not involve unfolding but instead you promote this folded dimer that will be more compact than the folded monomer in a crowded world. And it also suggests that in vivo, 
carvalbum indefinitely with warm amyloids. So what's next here? Well, we want to go back to, to look at the effect of crowding on, on, on amyloid formation using NMR so we get to we aim for residue-specific resolution. If we do seeded experiments in an NMR test tube, we can follow the reaction in a different way compared to the fluorescent signals that I show you here. And then we can use that type of setup to add in crowders, maybe membranes and so on, to learn more about the mechanism of these reactions. So with that, I come to the end. I don't have so much clue about the time, but I hope it's fine. Um, this is my current research group. I want to point out Ranjit Kumar. He's my research engineer, and he's really essential because he makes all our synuclein and all the variants, and it's really important to have a good source of protein when you work with synuclein. Istvan Horvath, I pointed him out already. I also want to, to note former students, Tony Banner, that did the parvalbumin work, and Stephanie Blockhurst, a former postdoc that introduced kind of the cell studies uh, to the lab. The funding, of course, and then thank you all for listening and for having me. Thank you very much, Pernilla, for the great talk. So the room is open for discussion. We mm -hmm. have already a few questions on the on the on the Q and A panel. So Chikum Liu asks, um, how can you tell whether it's parvalbum in amyloid rather than monomers or oligomers that prevent the amyloid formation of alpha synuclein? Yeah, because, because we see, well, okay, because I think we can preform the amyloids and mm -hmm. they would block synuclein amyloid formation. And then they are in the amyloid fold, right? And mm -hmm. we, if we have the monomers, we have to wait on the liform amyloids. I mean, in principle, yeah, I think the evidence, the, the data support, strongly support, you must have the amyloids in order to, to block the reaction. You also have the calcium bound form that never forms amyloids and have the same structure, mm -hmm. but doesn't do anything to synuclein. I guess that one way to test this is, as a connected question would be to, to sample uh, parvalbumin along its aggregation curve and assay those species, the assay the effect of, of those species on, on, on the form on the amyloid formation by facility. I think that's that's the sense of uh, Chikun's yeah. questions. Okay. Yeah. Good. No, I think and I think what makes sense actually what matters is that the initial kinetics that we did, parvalbumin aggregation mm -hmm. is faster than the nucleus. And mm -hmm. therefore if you mix the two proteins, one kind of forms amyloids before the other one begins, and then you can start a block. Okay, okay. Thank but, you. but it's a good question, yeah. and we can do more there, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we have Mercy uh, Best uh, asking, so in addition to beta amyloids, if you have studied tau oligomers in your model uh, on the, on the sec regarding the second part of your talk, so on parval, you mean? Let me see, let me see, hear the question one more time. So the question was, so uh, you, you checked if- oh, um, oh, okay. We have not tested how Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To me, parvalbumin, I think the, the question is meant if parvalbumin can block tau. Mm -hmm. I would love to test that, but I don't know. Okay. I don't make tau. Okay, so then we can talk need some afterwards. Tau, please, but I would love to test that. Okay, we, we can follow up that, the two of us mm -hmm. later, because I, I can supply. Because you so, okay, <laughs> yeah. So, and then, and then we have... Okay, I, I, yeah, I see the questions too now. So then we have uh, Dr. Ethan Larner, which has, well, thanks for the fantastic talk as, as the previous speakers. And he asks regarding crowding, if you use macromolecular crowding and, and uh, sucrose as control. So what about small molecular crowding, crowders such as Tmao or Trialose? Did you, did you try them? Did you get the difference if you did? We tried some, some glycerol, we tried a few different, but we haven't done it extensively. And, mm -hmm. and we should do more because I mean, it's, uh, it's not black and white. I mean, you have effects on, on, on steric effects, but I mean, small crowders can also do some steric effects and then you have the solvent effects. 
so far we see that all these small molecules seems to slow reactions down. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I see this crowding, there's a lot more to do there. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and, then, and then we have um, uh, a question from an anonymous attendee, which, which asks about calcium. So would, the question is basically if you have if you tested any other charged molecules, because it, the logic is that would it be possible that any other small positively charged molecule could have the same effect on alpha synuclein aggregation? Because when we add the calcium, we can release synuclein from the fibers and synuclein starts to aggregate. So perhaps you can add, you can probably add magnesium, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. would also bind to these loops. Maybe you, but the point is that you maybe when you add something, it can bind to synuclein and pull it mm -hmm. off that way, right? So what I thought now, which doesn't have to be true, is that the calcium binds to the pervalbumin fiber and kicks out synuclein. But mm -hmm. you can also have binding to synuclein, and then you can maybe pull it out. Okay. It will be interesting. For example, you can also add, say, uh, lipid vesicles and see if that will, you know, you compete for the synuclein with something else and see what happens. Okay, and then I have a follow up question uh, before moving up uh, to, to a different topic. So it has to do with the fact that if you, for this cross uh, effects between parvalbumin uh, amyloids and alpha synuclein, so did you, did you, for example, try immunoglobulin labeling experiments with, with them? To, to check for this uh, interaction? I mean, so what we do, did with TAM was the gold nanoparticles where we used okay. antibodies. Okay, okay, okay. So, so, I mean, in principle, I didn't label synuclein. I mean, I could have labeled, but I labeled the antibody and that's as close as we got. Okay, 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 good. Then we have a, a question about, uh, about the, the concentration of uh, hydrogen peroxide that you've used in your experiments. So uh, sorry, I can't read the full name. Mahari Haran asks, so H2O2 used are high concentration for disulfide formation. Does uh, it have physiological relevance? 100 micromolar of H2O2? <laughs> probably yeah. not. Yeah. Probably there's a lot of things in the experiments that don't, it's not necessarily directly relevant for the scenario in vivo, but it's a way to, to force, to, to see how you can shift the reaction to more oxidizing conditions. So I would get them, you know, more disulfides maybe. Mm -hmm. And I can see if that has a positive or negative effect on the reaction kinetic. Okay. So it's a way to play with it, with, with um, chemicals in order to enhance something that, you know, we want to see if that matters. I would say that in vivo, that's it's yeah it's way too high compared to in vivo but it could be in that direction yeah, yeah. and then we have a kind of a follow-up comment by uh, Ethan Lerner says thank you yes we do macromolecular crowding have the excluded volume effect that protein scales that tamau or thrillos have at smaller scales on it so I guess this is a this is a comment yeah. to your, your, your reply no, you, you're right, and I know that, and I think I want to, I want to do more of that. I mean, then crowding agents are complicated. There's, there could be a lot of factors, so you have to be careful. But still, it's a way to kind of learn what entropy, entropy what processes are involved in these reactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is there any other question uh, from the audience? Okay, so if not, thank you very much, Vanilla. It was a very exciting talk an overview of your recent work so let's move on to the next speaker i i give